On this episode of Purposely Curious, I sit down with Enrique Nunez, my friend of 20 years who also happens to be a photographer for some of my favorite rock bands. He fills us in on how he went from a little boy with rock posters on his wall to now photographing and interviewing these bands. So get nice and cozy because we're about to rock and roll. Yeah, baby. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I wanted to introduce you guys to one of my friends. Um, his name is Enrique. Say hi. Enrique Nunez. Hello, everyone. Um, so uh, Enrique is a rock and roll wedding photographer, a photojournalist, entrepreneur, music, Star Wars, and The Office, and The Office enthusiast. Exactly. Yeah. I love and The Office. I was telling him what other guy <laughs> isn't. Um, <laughs> That's what she said. <laughs> <laughs> Among other things. <laughs> But I wanted to have him on because he is a photographer and he gets all these opportunities and he's uh, literally taking pictures of rock and roll artists and bands and it's amazing. I mean, this guy comes up with amazing <laughs> pictures. Um, but the way he and I met, um, I was in high school. I went to an all girls private school um, that was Catholic. Um, so I did not, how would I say it? Um, I had a Spanish class that I failed. It was an elective class. That's how you get there. Huh? Yes. So in my school, they give you an entrance, entrance exam. And I was, I placed in native Spanish because I speak native Spanish. Um, but I somehow failed the class. <laughs> <laughs> so because it was an elective, they said you can take a summer class um, of your choice as long as it meets certain requirements. And I ended up at, uh, I can't remember what school it was. It was an adult school. Friedman Animation. I ended up Friedman there. Animation in downtown LA by the General Hospital. No, wait, is it? Cali uh, yeah, one of the hospitals. Wasn't it? Venice and Olive. Uh, California. California Hospital. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And that's. I think I was like the only girl in the class. You were one of the very few. And of course, you were the heartbreaker in the class. Was I? Yes. Oh. Yes. Uh, How so? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if you guys follow Mary, if you guys follow Mary, um, very cute, very spunky girl who, you know, comes <laughs> to animation class, which was mostly men. And yeah. there, you know, this girl comes into the classroom who looks very different than the rest of us. And then everyone and their grandpas i don't know their mamas but everyone <laughs> and their grandpas were, had a had a crush on you oh really i didn't yeah. know this <laughs> heartbreaker oh my that's God. how she's known i <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it had not, a lot of hasn't changed i guess <laughs> Free um, man animation that's yes right. yes that's how we met that was like 20 years ago yes and we bonded over music we did actually i i think the saint vincent's church or school that too uh conversation came up and then you said, wait, um, I think I talked about my cousins. And he said, wait, I think I know that guy because your brother was my cousin's classmate. Yes, that I is true. Yes, you have way better memory than I and do. Then, and then right. I think that's how we were like, wait, you know about St. Vincent's? Like, yeah, that's my church. And you're like, I went there. And then we have some common friends. I think, you know, Celeste. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A longtime friend of mine. Yeah. She's yeah. probably watching Celeste. <laughs> So um, basically, uh, I went to a private Catholic school, and so that's, I think, how all these people that we kind of knew together yep. in the parish, and so we always had that link, and so I think that's how we started bonding, and Correct. then it moved into music. Moved into music. We, yeah, so um, back then, I was a Catholic school girl who loved rock, loved Tool, loved Ramstein, you know, but not a lot of people in school like that stuff. Hip hop was more the the thing the back thing. then, yeah. And you and I kind of hit it off, um, and and I hit it off with quite a few people there. It, it seemed like there was a lot of rockers in the class. Yeah, yeah, there was. Yeah, a couple. Yeah. Yeah, and then, like you said, it was mostly guys. Mostly guys, I'm sure. Yeah. So I am a creative mind, even though I, it seems that I've geared to towards different. I guess career in that sense, but 
Um, we, I think we both are. Maybe that's why we bonded too. <laughs> yeah. Creatives. <laughs> Creatives unite. Yeah. So th- I got that. I took that class in order to pass. Um, I'm so thankful you took that class. I, you're so thankful I, <laughs> because I, I met failed you. Spanish. Yeah, I'm so <laughs> thankful you're the, the native Spanish speaker failed Spanish because yeah. that's how I met you. Yeah, the damn nurse. 20 N- years after. Nurse. The damn nun <laughs> failed me. <laughs> Miss, Ka- Miss, was it uh, Sister Cabrini? Sister no, Sister that Sean? was in uh, elementary school. Oh, in elementary yeah. school. Oh. So, um, but yeah, so let's get to the good stuff. So you uh, have, when did you know, let's just start there. When did you know that you liked photography? I never knew. You never knew. So I have a f- um, an old friend of mine um, who mentioned once to me, well, he said to me, you should be, um, you should dedicate yourself to photography. You're, he said this, you're good. But of course, I never believed it. And I, to this day, of course, everyone is very critical of their own work. To this day, I don't think I'm that good because I look up to people who are way above me. So it's always an inspiration. But at the time, he said, "You should, um, you should like really do this for for a living or or more serious." And then for me, it was just a hobby. And I always say it, um, that it was just a hobby. It was just something I like to do, but it wasn't a professional career choice. I did study animation. I finished my my training in animation, but I never went into the animation world. Um, so. Looking back, after he mentioned that, I guess he just planted the seed. And then back in 2007, I sort of uh, gave my two-week notice at this job I had selling furniture. And um, I said, I'm going to be a wedding photographer because it's good money. Of course, you think about the amount that you, you know, or the, the packages that you charge for. But there's a lot of work involved in that. Mm-hmm. But um, I said, you know what? I, I should do that. I'm, I'm, I think I'm okay uh, at photography and I can shoot weddings and I can work one weekend and be off for the next two three weeks four weeks but to make short I realized that I had always had a camera on me I've been taking pictures since I can remember maybe I was like five six years old seven years old for those of you listening who are our age or around our age you might remember the 110 millimeter cameras it's that film or that roll that plastic f- roll that looks like the voice ma- uh, voicemail uh, notification. It was like a little line and then two little circles on the sides. So those were the 110 millimeter film uh, rolls. And and then um, I remember we went to a vacation to Guatemala and I took pictures of Chiapas and Guatemala and and then, like I said, I went back and I started thinking, gosh, I've always had a camera in my hands. And then I was, since I can, I, uh, one, my uncle, who's like my dad, bought me, uh, bought, uh, got me a uh, VHS-C camera. Mm-hmm. So when everyone else had those cameras that you mounted on your shoulder, he bought one of those camcorders. So I always had a camera. I was always taking pictures. I've always been around, you know, certain situations that I wanted to document. And, but to me, it was just a hobby. Yeah. So I never really knew that I wanted to do that. I never really knew. It just happened throughout the years. Yeah. And so um, I want to get into the good stuff, the juicy stuff. Um, you That's have what you said. <laughs> Expect a lot of that. Oh, my God. <laughs> the office inspired. <laughs> <laughs> but you have uh, filmed, you know, taking pictures of a lot of famous rock bands out there. Um, you have also interview. Is that correct? Yes, that's what I call the fun part. The bread and butter, the weddings, the fun part is rock and roll, which of course, it's a career too. I you know, charge for my work, I have bands that approach me, but there's a lot of good stories. I'm sure you, before I go into that, you know firsthand how we were at the Ramstein concert and how did you get backstage, Mary? You took me. <laughs> <laughs> so I w- am a huge fan of Ramstein and a huge fan of Stone Sour and a few f- huge fan of Corn, and they happen to all be playing together. So I bought tickets for me and my brother. Um, we drove to Vegas, and you happen to be there. Next thing you know, at the end of the show, I'm backstage with all the rock stars. You know, like people I never, I could only dream <laughs> of, like. <laughs> I, we were just talking about DJ Ashba was having some water and then I think I was walking I literally was holding you holding your hand and walking you walking around with you and then like see this guy yeah 
this is that Guns N' Roses guitar player. So this guy, yeah. And then, do you remember Richard Cruzpe ended up showing on to the showing up to the party? Yeah, he which at you me. were so afraid to take a picture with. Yeah. Told, you know, he winked at me. He did. <laughs> yeah. And he kept staring. And I'm like, why is he staring at me? I'm wearing like shorts, just like a, t- like a muscle shirt with glasses. <laughs> were, yeah. Like, I'm like, oh. You, were, you, <laughs> you stood out because everyone else looked like Hollywood, you know, trying maybe too hard. And you look really good, but it's just, yeah. you attended a show. You're, you're not trying hard. I wasn't trying hard. I literally had my Vans on, short shorts you know my glasses and like and then i noticed him and i got i got really <laughs> excited and i was like oh my god and then later i noticed he was staring at me like and really obvious and i was i felt awkward and i would look away <laughs> i was like yeah no this is not that was good <laughs> and one of those life experiences yes yes but you took advantage of it and i'm sorry if, if you're listening um this is the time with the disclaimer comes we actually try to wait for your brother yeah but he went to the restroom he, I think he met up with someone or he was just doing his own thing. And you so text them like, I text him, hurry. He didn't. So yeah. I was like, all right, bye. He <laughs> didn't make it. He didn't make it on time. And we got snug into backstage. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So that was just one story, obviously. Um, but I know that you um, have also, you were up there. You have some stories about Metallica. Oh, yes. So many stories. Rock and roll. I always look back at the... Um, I always say that the blessing of being able to do this because I was born in in Puebla, Mexico. I came to the U.S. when I was eight years old. I was just here on vacation because my mom lived here. Um, she moved here years, uh, a few years be- before that, and my family was very reluctant for for me to grow up in the U.S. So actually, one of the things that happened is um, one of my friends had some, you know, some gangs were trying to recruit him and they were afraid for my life. And then they asked me at some point, do you want to go to Catholic school, which St. Vincent would have been mm-hmm. the option, or do you want to go to Mexico till everything just calms down? And I chose to just go back to Mexico. Um, anyways, that's a different story. But um, the reason I brought this up is while I was, when I went back to Mexico and I set up my room over there in, in our house in Mexico, I set up all these posters in my room of all the bands that I liked, you know, um, that I grew up listening to. I think I became a, I reference Pink Floyd, The Wall, as being my first influence. Like, I think I was like six years old, and I remember that I used to think, I like this. I don't know what this is, but I like this. Mm -hmm. No one in my family listened to rock or metal or hard rock or, you know, hair metal, none of that. Um, But somehow I think an uncle, my aunt, or someone in my, Someone in my um, my grandma's house, I think they had um, that that record. Anyway, so I think I, I got a hand, uh, hold of that, and I checked it out. I liked it. I was five, six years old, and then at eight or nine, I think I made the decision, and I said, I like this. I want to. This is the kind of music I like. And at the time, it was Guns N' Roses and Metallica. Yeah. Being the on the on you know during their um. 91, 92 tour. So they were at the I peak. Lean, yeah, yeah. But at the peak of the career, the Black Album. So I lean more towards Metallica and Heavy Metal. But where I was heading with that is my room was always full of posters. Sepultura, Metallica, Red Hot Chili Peppers, uh, Megadeth, you name it. Like Guns N' Roses, all these bands, right? White Zombie, Rob Zombie, of course. Uh, anyway, so um, I was, al- I guess in a way, I was always drawn to that, of course. And mm-hmm. the music and the imagery. But... Um, when I think about a small town boy who was really good at school, I mean, I, I had great grades. Uh, like, uh, I was always just like the good kid and doing g- good in school and the grades. And uh, growing up in in a Catholic family where maybe my music wasn't my choice of music wasn't uh, the f- <laughs> what they wanted me to listen maybe at first. But um, uh, I never really thought of or consider doing or that I would ever meet someone famous. I remember meeting the Guns N' Roses drummer and he was, that was like the highlight of my life at the time. And that was it. I never really pursued that. And it just sort of happened. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so that, that was like with the posters. Now, specific stories. Yes, Metallica. Going back to Metallica. So yes. the, the Metallica story, I drove to Sacramento and Stockton, after I had already met Lars here and escorted him out, uh, escorted Lars out of the uh, premiere of the Through the Never, 
And then I told my sister and my friend, hey, we should go to Sacramento and try to meet James. Yeah. So Through the Never is a movie. It's a, uh, yeah, it's a Metallica movie. Yeah. It's not a documentary. It's kind of like half cinematic, half documentary mm-hmm. concert movie. And side note, Lars is a soccer fan, FYI. Oh, go. he is? Yes, he is. <laughs> <laughs> what was his team? You know, I don't know off the top of my head. I know, I believe he follows Seattle. I'm not sure. Ah. But Metallica tweeted a, like a soccer reference to a European League thing. And I was like, this is Lars. This is your thing. This yeah. is <laughs> Lars 100%. But soccer fan. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, rock and roll has given me a lot of opportunities in that in that aspect. I went, uh, it, was, it was not an official magazine coverage. It was more like, I want to go and cover this on my own. So mm-hmm. out of our own pocket, we drove to Sacramento, San Francisco, Stockton, I <laughs> disclaimer you shouldn't do this, okay? But I literally walked into the um, the uh, the movie theater with my gear, like two sets of cam, like a, a set of two cameras and all this gear hanging all around me, you know, just all set up to cover. And I literally just walked past security and the attendant, and they just looked at me like, uh, "Are you?" And I'm like, "Oh, I'm here to cover for the movie," and and they just let me through, mm. no questions asked. And then I just kept on covering the event. Uh, James came out, introduced the movie, and then left. So I kind of got the hang of how he was doing all the introductions for what I've seen in Downey and then Sacramento. So we drove to Stockton. And I figured he's going to come out through this door. I had to figure what side the theater is on. And then we'll try to catch him at the end or mm-hmm. try to get a picture. Why? Because it had been 25 years of admiring this guy, like he's my main influence, front man, most influential guy in music for me. So I said, I'll, I'll die happy if I take a picture with him. And f- driving five, six hundred miles, it'll be so worth it to just get a picture with him. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know, as he was stepping out of the second presentation, I escorted him out taking pictures and video. He looks at me, he smiles and like, you again? Like, didn't I just see you? Like, yeah, that's me. And yeah, just you gave have me, a like, distinct look. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like you with Richard like he winked at me gave me a thumbs up and like cool uh, and I was just pretty much walking down the street with him and I was pretty much like escorting him to his ride and everyone got pushed away but me mm-hmm. in a way so that was a cool story about being able to document rock and roll and sometimes the photo- the cameras make it look official yeah. even if you're not yeah seriously so let's l- continue with metallica um you have a story on lloyd grant the first metallica um guitar player let's make this quick yes we were at affliction clothing um shout out to my my bud jose mangan uh the metal ambassador as he's known who happens to be he always says he's mexicano i give him a hard time because he's uh half french half mexican mm-hmm. jose Majan. Mm-hmm. everyone calls him jose mangan um so he's he's the man in metal right now. Uh, anyway, so he was hosting a, an event at Affliction for Metal Blade Records um, and Armor Saint, who just re- actually just released an album. Uh, Armor Saint and Metallica, you know, they used to be like have shows together way back in the day. Mm-hmm. And not only they're contemporaries with Metallica, but they're led by two Mexican brothers, mm-hmm. the Sandoval brothers. Yeah. So Metal Blade Records, uh, like I was saying, and um, um we were at this event at Affliction, and then there was a trivia question for a price. And someone asked, or well, he asked, who is the first Metallica guitar player? Um, people were yelling, Dave Mustaine, Kirk Hammond. And I mean, I know the answer. I'm a Metallica fan. Uh, little did I realize, or did I know, I'm sorry, that, um, well, someone said, uh, Lloyd Grant is that that's correct and then people start waving at Jose where I am like right where I am people start waving at Jose and pointing this way and I even thought like are they pointing at me or do I, because I know the answer and then he turns around and he says what he looks like we're towards me right he's on stage and he's toward, looking at me towards my area and then uh, someone says Lloyd Grant is here I turn around and Lloyd Grant standing right next to me <laughs> and my wife was wearing a Metallica shirt mm-hmm. pregnant with our child. Aww. I'm like, this is not coincidence. Dude. Like, it's you know, destiny. It's destiny. And then <laughs> uh, I met Lloyd Grant that day. We kept in touch. And this last January, the first thing he asked me was, hey, Enrique, how you doing? Blah, blah, you know, good to see you. And then he asked me, first thing he asked me was, how is Cora doing? 
your baby is so full of energy. I'm so happy for her. You know, she's, I love seeing her grow up. And it's my f jaw just floored. I mean, yeah, I mean, he may not be a Metallica right now, but he's the first Metallica, you know, that first song that Metallica released, he's the guitar player in it. Um, and he follows up. I mean, he keeps up with my, my life story sometimes and my baby. Isn't that amazing? That's really cool. Yeah. And he met my baby in her mommy's room and, and she was wearing a Metallica shirt. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that is really, really cool. <laughs> Anything that has to do with Metallica excites me. Now, um, let's move on to another band. Um, there is a band called Mana. Mana. That's a big rock band I from Mexico, from correct? Mexico, yeah. So tell me, what do you know or what, what story you have? Story with Mana. <laughs> Alex Gonzalez, I, um, if not a lot of people know, Alex Gonzalez is the drummer for Mana. Uh, but he's a very, very talented of course, you guys know him as the drummer from Maná, but a, a <laughs> very talented metal drummer. Mm -hmm. So he has a side project called La Tierra. Uh, it's himself, Andreas Kisser from Sepultura, another one of my favorite bands. Mm -hmm. uh, Harold Hopkins from Puya, Puya. And then he just substitutes Señor Flavio from Los Fabulosos Cadillacs. And Andres Jimenez from Animal. So the point is, um, I interviewed him for a... Um, for, uh, uh, the release, uh, the last tour when he was here in, in LA. So here's the, here's the great thing about this. If you're trying to meet any of the Mana guys, you're not getting near them because they have tons of security around them. Um, I mean, you know, they sell out Staples Center, the forum, what, five nights in a row. Yeah. That's the kind of band they are. I guess only Taylor Swift does that. Yeah. So for those of you listening around the world, because I, I have, People, I mean, people in India are listening. I'm still flabbergasted by that, but <laughs> cool. they are essentially, uh, if you guys have heard of Metallica, they're like the Metallica. When And when I say the Metallica, the music isn't the same, Correct. but in regards of how big Metallica is, that's yes. what they are for Mexico. Yes. As and far Latin as America. And Latin yeah. America and when it comes to rock and yeah. they're still selling out. Oh, yeah. They're like the, roll put the Rolling Stones yeah. of Mexico. So yeah. I, I know maybe the Rolling Stones or these major bands they sell out what 20,000 seat venues maybe mm -hmm. one maybe two nights yeah Mana sells five nights in a row yeah so and that just goes to show that you that's just how mm -hmm. big they are exactly so Man Alex's side band comes to LA de la tierra his his side project which is more metal uh, oriented Mana is more rock pop now uh they used to be more rock now they're more pop rock uh anyway so uh, I interviewed him, and then at the end of the whole interview, I, I just told him, hey, Alex, do you remember this one time you did an interview for a radio show? And this lady called in, and he, she said, hey, my name is, you know, people call me Mama Mana, which is the band's name, but um, a lot of people from my retreat and my church uh, program, they call me Mana. Funny story. That's what they call me. Uh, so I asked Alex, and he said, yeah, I remember that interview. And actually, my mom was, hung, the host of the radio show hung up on my mom because they thought it was a prank call. <laughs> so they hung up on my mom. And so they actually, you know, she spoke to a couple of the guys from Mana, but they hung up on her. Like, yeah, yeah, whatever, lady. And they hung up on her. So I asked Alex, like, do you remember that call? You know, this, isn't that. And she's like, yeah. Well, I remember that call. Yeah, yeah, it was an interview, et cetera, on the radio station. I said, yeah, that was my mom. <laughs> they actually call her Mama Mana because people call me Mana, so. I was a little embarrassed to say that because his band is Mana. And he started laughing and, and he's like, you know, sending greetings to my mom. And um, he's always been such a, you know, reply some messages to my messages on Instagram, repost stuff th about me. Um, anyone that, if you have a party here for Latinos, uh, Hispanic people in LA, in the US, you are dancing to one of these Mana songs for sure. Yeah, and oh. if, if th this means if you're like from any other culture and you've been to a quinceañera, <laughs> a wedding, a party, if people are drinking, they're dancing to that shit. How does it go? <laughs> oh, oh yeah, mi amor. amor. <laughs> no me, <laughs> me digas, digas que, que no. no. That's Alex, yeah, or, or me vale. Yeah, so <laughs> for sure, if you guys have been drinking or at any of these parties, <laughs> that shit always pops up on the rotation. For sure. <laughs> Alex Alex is such a great guy. He, he's very, very humble. Yeah. Very cool guy. Yeah. 
Um, so let's move on. Same genre, metal, right? What do you have to say about Slayer, uh, Dave Lombardo? Dave Lombardo. I I was covering an event for his art, which was Rhythm and Motion. Funny thing is, uh, there's this company who started taking long exposures of drummers mm -hmm. with light sticks. Mm -hmm. So they would do long exposures and, uh, you know, they're painting with light. <laughs> They may, I mean, I'm not saying it. I came, well, you know, maybe they did get um, Bill Ward from uh, Black Sabbath. They got Dave Lombardo from X Slayer, of course. Um, Steven Adler from Guns N' Roses, et cetera. They got some of these drummers to sit down in front of the drum kit, um, jam to the songs. Like, for instance, uh, Steven Adler, he was jamming to Appetite for Destruction, which we know it's one of the top rock albums in all rock existence and music right so let's say he was drumming to welcome to the jungle and whatever they captured uh with painting with light the drumsticks were actually like um uh, they were lit right and um so they were selling the art off that whatever they captured so dave lombardo had a, had his art exhibition and i went to cover it and i had met him before we had crossed paths a couple of times and i was actually wearing my metalachi shirt Mm -hmm. um, I, I've worked with Metalachi for like maybe close to 10 years, if not 10 years already. And I think one of my first encounters, I was actually on stage uh, waiting for the encore. Of course, working with a band for so long, they, they're very generous and kind to just give me artist access a lot of times because my work speaks for, for itself, right? And my, I try to keep it very professional, of course. The fan and in the fan Enrique the 16 the 15 year old 13 year old <laughs> freaks out whenever he meets one of his rock star uh, yeah, one of his uh, idols. idols right growing up but the professional Enrique the photographer has to keep it cool and keep documenting so I'm behind the kit and I was wondering why is there a drum kit if Mentalachi doesn't use a drum kit so they introduced the encore it, it was super secret even for me even though I have access to some information but uh, Dave Lombardo comes out, and I was, like you said, flabbergasted. I was stoked to see Dave Lombardo standing right next to me, and he played Raining Blood, of course, one of the, you know, one of the greatest or most recognizable songs in Trash Metal, et cetera. So um, I had met him before, crossed paths, chatted. I see him at this other event. Um, so I'm asking him about his art and his exhibition, and I was telling you earlier it sometimes it feels like it's the uh the stupid side of my brain mm -hmm. <laughs> and the what did i say what did i call it earlier the uh professional the more side. professional side of my brain the yeah the <laughs> rational side of my brain they sometimes um are uh, um uh compete to to overcome the other <laughs> side mm -hmm. and uh my rational side of the brain said keep being professional but then again if you know me if you see my interviews i just really I become myself. I become comfortable, and then I start joking around, and I say jokes, and I'm more like, ha, 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 hoo, 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 I make it fun, or I try to make it fun. Um, but if, if you guys have ever seen Wayne's World, remember that part when Wayne tells Cassandra, is everyone kung fu fighting tonight? And then he does a karate pose, and then he's expecting to get like his butt whipped, or whip, right? because uh, he's like, oh, shoot, I said it. I hope she doesn't kick my ass. So that's kind of like how I felt because <laughs> Dave Lombardo is telling me about his art. And then I just um, remember that he's Cuban, which I knew. I knew that he was uh, uh, he grew up in Southgate. And I actually know someone who was his neighbor. And some other details of some family members that follow me on Instagram, etc. So I don't have relationships, I mean, personal relationship or friendship relationship, but, um, you know, we have a lot of friends in common or people in common. And then the first thing that my uh, stupid side of the brain says, thinks about is ask him if he still says, oye, me chico, which is a Cuban slang. I don't, I didn't, I don't think that's offensive, but um, that's the first thing that popped out of my head. And then the other, the rational side of the brain goes, oh, shoot, you didn't say that. Dave Lombardo took a couple seconds to react. I guess he, yeah, he was process. reacting. He was he was processing, and he said, uh, uh, "And in those two three seconds, seemed like an eternity." And I'm thinking, "Oh shoot, that's it. This is the end of my career <laughs> as, as an interviewer mm -hmm. with rock stars." 
And then he goes on into full Cuban mode. Uh, yo, bueno, sí, yo, yo soy cubano, yo, crecí, yo nací en Cuba. And he goes on full Cuban mode. And I was both excited and frightened because I didn't know how to follow up to that. Even though I speak Spanish, I, <laughs> uh, should I continue speaking Spanish <laughs> and speak like, you know, do my Mexican accent and then Cuban and Mexican? Or uh, do I just stay away from that and go back to English? Um, it was really cool. He, I Googled, Googled uh, some reason, try to Google another interview in Spanish. Like I told you, I don't think, I'm not sure if it's the only one, but I haven't found another interview in Spanish. If anyone has found it, please let me know. So I can stop saying that, but I, I haven't found any other interview in Spanish with David. Yeah, Lombardo. and not only that, you you know, a lot of people probably didn't realize that he, he spoke Spanish. Spanish. Yeah, yeah, Cuban born. Yeah, so I actually saw Slayer um, at the Big Four with Metallica, Anthrax, Megadeth. Uh, Coachella. Co right, yeah. So I went to Coachella. There's so many. I did Coachella so many years, but this was the f this is before they did the two weekends. This is how long ago it was. Um, this was before Stagecoach. So for those of you who, who don't know uh, how Coachella is set up, Coachella is literally in the desert in polo fields, which is like a huge golf course community. Um, they would do Coachella just one weekend. And before they used to sell day passes. Right. Which would be you would buy Friday or Saturday. And uh, Coachella had more rock bands back then. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Tool played their Rage Against the Machine. Caifanes. Yes. A Mexican band. Yeah. That totally changed. They started selling weekend passes. And then I think they decided, let's leave uh, Metallica, Slayer, Megadeth, and Anthrax were doing like a tour. The, the big four, yeah. The big four. And so they left the stage, one at least the biggest stage. Because um, uh, in Coachella, there's several stages, but they left the stage, the big uh -huh. main one. So I went the next went back to Coachella the next weekend for this. Look at you! And it was amazing because I was too young, you know, like when you met me, and <laughs> I w I didn't have the funds, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm at Coachella two <laughs> weekends in a row for two. Who you know, parties like you? I would oh, be I like you when I grow up. <laughs> 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 I mean, I am a lot of fun. <laughs> I know, fun. even though even though some people think I'm boring, but <laughs> I'm a lot of fun. But anyways. It was amazing for me to see that. Um, I had never been in, I had been to rock concerts, but in a venue. Does yeah. that make sense? Not a, not a metal festival not with a all metal this sweaty. Not a metal festival with thousands of fucking people. I mean, <laughs> and to see, you know, I, I was able to at least say that I saw Slayer once. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, so that's my Slayer story. That's <laughs> nice. That's cool. I Actually, I, I bought my ticket. For, for Amazon, when you said earlier, just so people know or... You know, yeah, we, we get access. It's never guaranteed. It's always up to, up, of course, the publicist, the label. Uh, it depends a lot if you have good, good relationships with, with, the, um, mm -hmm. with the band, with the, with the PR company, with, you know, a lot of things, um, a lot of factors. But actually for the Ramstein concert or the Hamstein concert, I bought my own ticket because I didn't know if I was going to cover. It was so like a week before that I was notified or invited. Thank you, Stone Sour. Thank you, Jay Rustin. Um, that I was going to, uh, and Miranda, who made it happen for me, uh, that I was going to be able to cover mm -hmm. that show. Yeah. So pretty much my ticket went to waste. But um, anyway, so that happened. For the big four, I bought my ticket. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I remember is a big part of the concert for the big four, I was babysitting my drunk friends. Yeah. <laughs> I missed a big part of it. Oh, my God. It was amazing. Yeah. Like, my friends, l the f okay, so I went from, like, a s my certain Coachella group friends, and then I went from, <laughs> like, my different, my, my different type <laughs> of friends, you know, <laughs> which it's crazy because if you guys see me, I don't necessarily, I mean, I give off rock vibes to an extent, mm. but I don't think I'm fully, like, rock. Yeah. Like, people... People aren't surprised because they'll see me with my Doc Martens or my Vans. You know what I mean? Like I have yeah, a yeah. certain like California rock yeah. vibe, but I'm also sometimes people are like. People might think you're Gwen Stefani. You know, like, <laughs> no, I, you know, it's crazy. We were, I, she came up in one of the episodes where we were talking about 90s nostalgia. Okay, yeah. And I was just saying that the demise of No Doubt was when they really went pop gearing <laughs> towards her. Yeah. Um, but anyways, yeah, that was my story. And um yeah, I, I, to see Metallica, Slayer, just to see those bands live in one stage was ridiculous. I mean, guys, I had never seen a fucking bonfire. Like, these people <laughs> were throwing, guys were taking off their shirts, 
throwing them in the middle, lighting that and shit up, dancing around dancing, the fire. And I was like, like "All right, I've been." Is this gonna be a barbecue? I hope no one lands <laughs> on top of the fire and starts. It roast. was crazy. It was I was like, "Yeah, it's definitely not safe." <laughs> <laughs> it was like day and night. Coachella was like PG, and people do drugs yeah, at yeah, Coachella, yeah. but it was. Like, I was gonna say, yeah, yeah, but it was PG. And then when I went to the Big Four, it was like it, heavy it's a different metal. environment. Yeah, and to be honest, I love how you can transition from one of the. And if you ask me to go to Coachella, I'm probably gonna. I will probably attend to shoot it. And then a lot of times I've met so many people that I don't know who they are. Because, I mean, I think I am very um, encased in rock and metal. So yeah. I have a friend who's a tour manager. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I Indirectly, I think I owe him that he helped me so much because he once gave me access to start shooting this one band that he used to work with. And... Um, he deals with I, you have no idea how many people I've seen of bands that I admire that they know this guy right he's mm-hmm. one of my best friends and uh, well Jerry I'm going to say his name Jerry so um, he um, I see so many people l- how much he's loved and appreciated but to this day he always tells me how do you remember the names of all these bands and people and like I know you do this like professionally like you work with bands and but how do you remember? And I'm like, it just comes natural. I guess a sports broadcaster, he, I mean, it amazes me how someone like football season learns 1,500 names. Yeah. And, or statistics, right? Or statistics. Like, yeah. 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 People ask me, I'm like, I don't know everything, but I can keep talking for hours about every person. You, we're at the shop. Can we say that? We're at my shop here in Pico Rivera. Everyone that comes into this, or I shouldn't have said that, but um, every, every person I come across and has is wearing a rock shirt. A lot of times I just have a, a story about that band shirt. Like, mm-hmm. there's got to be a story. Yeah. I didn't get to see the full Big Four, but I got, I've got i seen Anthrax a couple of times from side stage. Mm-hmm. Um, I've seen, well, I mean, I met Metallica, you know, a couple, except Kirk from, you know, different situations. Uh, Slayer, you know, Dave Lombardo and Kerry King. Kerry King was there when at the, you remember we were stepping out? And Kerry King was walking in. I don't know if you remember that. Hmm. Uh, when we were all meeting outside before we went to have dinner, breakfast. Yeah. After backstage, we were walking out. And then I told him, oh, that's Kerry King coming. That's that. So Kerry King was there. Uh, anyway, so uh, Anthrax. Uh, can, we, can we just go back to the breakfast thing? Can you tell them <laughs> who we were having breakfast with? Uh, um, yes. Um, <laughs> do you want to say also how I fell? <laughs> off my chair my <laughs> backpack was so heavy that it it pulled my chair i did not notice my chair had fallen back and i tried to sit on my chair and i became the biggest clown and i looked so stupid in front of everyone <laughs> everyone thought i was drunk because of course there was free booze backstage yeah and you didn't you you, you had one drink i think i might have had one drink. yeah 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 we're uh, yeah you told me like i had one and i don't think i should have any more <laughs> so, um breakfast yes so actually it was Susie. Uh, from iTunes, uh, she's like the gatekeeper to all music in iTunes. Uh, someone we cross paths with uh, a lot of times. Um, uh, Jay, who produced Stone Sour, uh, Corey Taylor, and Avatar, and Amon Amar, and all these bands. Uh, a buddy of, buddy of mine, very very cool, successful producer. Um, Miranda, I think Miranda, my friend, was there. She's my my BFF. Uh, she calls me the metal Mexican. She's uh, honorary Mexican, even though she's from uh, from England. But she's an honorary Mexican now. She's on her way to gaining cool Mexican points. Um, and a couple of Stone Sour members, I think. Yeah. Uh, so that alone, like <laughs> I went to a concert, and I'm like, okay, now I'm having breakfast <laughs> with Stone Sour's like band members. <laughs> that's what's up. Yeah, like. That's what's up. <laughs> We're having oh oh and <laughs> Roy. Yeah, Roy Mayorga, man, this guy. He started with Soulfly, which, of course, if you know anything, just uh, let my soul <laughs> fly free. <laughs> so Soulfly, right? That was um, Max uh, Cavalera's after he departed Sepultura. That was his his band, and Roy Mayorga was part of that band, and he was with Ministry at some point, and with Stone Sour, and I admire the guy. And next thing you know, what is Roy doing for us? He's buying us drinks. Yeah. By the way, we still owe him. Yeah, we do. Yeah, we still owe him uh, <laughs> a beer or some drinks. We told him we we owe him. Yeah. But that was that was a nice. That that to experience. me that's a nice experience. <laughs> like okay, so now I'm 
you know, You're and, fishing. and I, w- You're I was rooming with my brother because we right. went for the weekend. So I, sh- I don't know what time I showed up at the room. <laughs> my uh, brother probably thought I was like, we, doing left, <laughs> we left like at four in the morning. The sun was 3 coming 30. Up. Yeah. Yeah. We wanted to keep partying, but Mary said, no, I have to go to the room. Like rock stars go to sleep <laughs> early. <laughs> You're a rock star now. So now let's go to uh, Guns N' Roses, Steve Adler. Steven Adler. Well, I, I, yeah, like I said earlier, I met the first Guns N' Roses drummer uh, in a clinic, but I, of course, Appetite for Destruction, who wasn't influenced by Appetite for Destruction? Mm-hmm. I got a chance to once, um, I didn't even get to interview him, but I was documenting this one band that Mike Klink pro- was producing, and Mike Klink is the producer for Appetite for Destruction. Um Anyway, so Steven Adler, I... I <laughs> By the way, I ca- you're scratching your beard and I can hear it. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> it's okay. I, it's like... <laughs> that's, that's the, it's the beer effect. I was trying not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> like I can really hear it because it's via the mic. It, it probably helps the uh, to visualize, to so help people visualize. visualize what I look like. <laughs> I have a beard and I, long I just hair. Keep, it sounds like paper. <laughs> 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 okay, go ahead. And uh, Steven Adler, I, I think um, that's, that, that was, that's one of those other highlights that how many millions of copies has Appetite for Destruction sold? Um, he's probably not known as one of the best drummers ever, but his personality, every time I've crossed paths with Steven Adler, he's such a warm, welcoming dude. And that's what I, I was telling you this earlier. I've met maybe, uh, a few Hollywood Boulevard um, uh I'm rock. I'm God's gift to man. Want to be rock stars? I mean, they're cool. Some people are really cool, but a lot of times they behave like they're legends and they're just starting. And I, we met like people like Dave Lombardo and Mm -hmm. all these other people, and they just behave like any other mere mortal that you cross paths within. Steven Adler. I mean, I got to interview him, and again, you know, the 12 year old me or 10 year old me was freaking out. Because I was wearing, you know, my Guns N' Roses shirt, of course, and then he points it out in my shirt, and he's like, "See, this is me. This is what I'm gonna look like when I die." And, you know, I was like, we had a good time, and he, you know, he, you could feel it was a genuine hug, and you know, thanks for coming, dude. And, you know, I see a lot of interviews be done, and a lot of times they just hate it because they do so many interviews, and they're like, "I'm done. I just wanna get over with your question and uh, be over with," just because you're, you know, they say the same. Uh, they respond to the same question maybe a million times, but but he was, I felt he was genuinely having a good time, and I sometimes don't even ask questions about their latest project. I just whatever comes out of my butt. Yeah, and, and <laughs> you know maybe that's what makes you stand out. Um, when you and I were backstage on that show, I I remember having a moment and being like, how do rock stars do this for decades on end? Yeah over and over like wouldn't that be boring so i can see why also being asked the same fucking question over and over or treated like that or being you know having their ass kissed yeah so maybe you come with a different approach it's like that probably helps yeah (laughs) no (laughs) seriously think about it do you remember i mean we we were there with um i was telling you this earlier were you dj ashba the former guns and roses guitar player he was standing uh, right next to us and i think I just started, what did I say? Uh, we should rename this. Oh, he was selling water at some point, or he had a brand of water, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken. And there was a, one of these name brand waters backstage, and I think he was grabbing a bottle of water, and I said, this is not Ashba water. And he just looked at me and was like, ha. Huh. I'm like, oh, okay, good, <laughs> good joke. <laughs> but that's a lot of times how I've connected with people. Yeah. Um, and if I mentioned to you earlier too, I was such a shy person. Um, I was not cool enough. I was not part of the Hollywood scene. I was starting at some point, and I was not there yet. And there were people that would push me aside. They're like, yeah, you're not cool. You're, we've been here long, and you know, um, I know this band, and I know this rocks, a couple of rock stars here and there, and or groupies. I would, especially the groupies were like, I would feel that they were the most um, annoying. Yeah, and maybe. You know, there was there were a couple of girls that I liked and I kind of wanted to approach them, but they were so, you're not that cool. I want to get together with this band member, or whatever, etc. And I was never the cool guy. But yeah, fuck them. No, yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now I look like, oh, thank you for making me dodge that bullet. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, fuck them. <laughs> 
So l- did you have anything more to say about uh, him or can Stephen I Adler? No, no, just I mean, it, it was it was just such a great experience. Uh, same thing as Dave. Uh, every time I cross paths or I remind them, uh, I just admire how he overcame his mm-hmm. his accident, you know, his overuse of drugs. And it's known how Guns N' Roses used to party. Uh, he was. You guys have heard the story how in uh, was it? Sorry, Mr. Brownstone. We band uh, uh. Yeah, it was Mr. Brownstone, right? That um, there the, you he, you can hear a girl moaning, and that was actually Steven Adler's girlfriend. Shut up. Having sex with Axel, <gasps> and they recorded. And I think I can't remember they they recorded them on purpose or they left the microphone recording. And of course, Steven Adler was like maybe fucking pissed and wow. And but I, it, it it worked so well that they left it in the recording for the song. That's what I know. That's what I remember. Same with "Where Do We Go" for uh, uh, "Sweet Child of Mine." I guess Axel was like, uh, "Where do we go? Like, what's next? What's next now? What do I sing?" But he kept saying, "Where do we go? Where do we go?" And it just sounded good, and they kept it. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> real story. Yeah. So we were discussing the show uh, where we were in Vegas. Um, Corn was also there. Yeah. And that was amazing for me to watch. I again, now that I have adult money, <laughs> right? <laughs> now that you're independent, woman, successful. Hell yeah, uh, motherfuckers! <laughs> <laughs> but you have a story about Mr. Brian Head Welch. Oh yeah. Um. There was actually this one time I saw Corn twice, two days straight. Mm-hmm. There was a Sirius XM show in downtown LA at the this one this theater in downtown LA. I forgot what the, what's called. And then we drove overnight to Sacramento for AfterShock Festival, and we saw him again the following night. Uh, of course, growing up, one of my favorite bands. Um, we got to interview uh, Brian Head Welch. Uh, of corn from corn and if you guys remember or know anything um, um about his life story he left corn for a few years uh he became a, a, a born again christian and and i get his process his his new ideals i guess interfere with his old lifestyle so he said you know i this is what i want now and i'm leaving the band and it's gonna cost me everything so anyway so he released a book I can't remember for the life of me the name of it right now, but it's. I would sometimes do book reviews as well, especially being rock or metal books. Mm-hmm. And of course, you know, being uh, part of a media outlet, um, sometimes we would get them to review like two weeks, three weeks, a month in advance, whatever, um, whenever right. they're available. So I read the book, and I'm not a, an avid reader, but I cannot put that book down. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially I related to his life story of how. You know, he was raising his child, and, and I think she was battling, um, I think, uh, I'm not sure if suicidal thoughts or uh, some 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 form of uh, uh, of uh, stress or something mm-hmm. like that. I can't re- recall exactly, but anyways, he released this book, and I identified with him so much. At the time, I didn't even, ha- my daughter had not been born, but my younger sister, my baby sister, I pretty much raised her, so... I feel like a dad towards her. Right. Um, so reading his life story, it was very, um, v- uh, I related so much to his life story. And then also because of the, the, you know, his life as a newborn Christian, I, I, I I've been raised, in, um, I was, I'm a ca- uh, cradle Catholic and uh, I'm still Catholic, but f- for some of us, I guess, it's hard to maybe be accepted that you are a person of faith, but you're in the metal world because of all the things that are known or all the notions that are conceived about yeah. being satanic and mm-hmm. such. You experience that. You know, you're in the Catholic school and you can't yeah. listen to this music. But I do. <laughs> I do too. And then, yeah. Anyway, so, um, but he, uh, he, I got to interview him about this book and, I, like I've interviewed a gazillion other pe- uh, rock stars, but this was this one was special because he was not afraid to talk about his faith. And then him and I started connecting about music. And then I told him, like, dude, you know, I play, you know, I'm a musician too, so of course I don't play corn songs. Uh, um, I mean, I love the band, but I just, you know, that's not one of my focuses to play corn songs. But we started talking about um, 
some Christian songs. And then he started singing there, like in Spanish too, like this verse of a song in Spanish. And I was, whoa, dude, was, like he doesn't speak Spanish, but he was singing a song in yeah, Spanish. Yeah. Now it's hard for people to picture that. Whoa, this metal God who's in this kind of band and blah, blah, blah. You know, he's a person of faith now. And I, I he's next to me sitting down on the couch and we're singing some Christian. Well, he's singing it. I wasn't, I, I didn't know the song, but he's singing a Christian song. It blows my mind. Mm -hmm. Things that you probably don't see or expect from an outside perspective being they're just average people. They're average humans. Yeah. And yeah. I'm just so lucky to be around those average people that seem like gods to many people or unreachable. Mm -hmm. And I love that. Yeah. So I approach him just like they're just average people. We talk about common things. Yeah. That was interesting for me. <laughs> yeah. No, totally. Um, did he rejoin? the band yeah yeah he did yeah, yeah he was he was away for a few years and uh he was actually playing a festival with his side project um or well, with his then uh current band and then corn was also playing that festival so i guess they were hesitant i don't for what i remember they were not um enemies or not like uh they had not left in the best terms as well you know but you know, when you see an old friend of 20 years and you had some differences and then I guess that both parties had the will to just, hey, I love you, man. I, I don't I may not agree where you are right now, but I love you. He didn't like where they were and they didn't maybe want to accept where he was or mm -hmm. his this new stage that he was in. So I guess they felt like it was in their it was going to going to interfere with their lifestyle. And he thought that he didn't want to go back to that. And if for what he said, well, um, for what I remember, what he mentioned was that, you know, um, he just uh, hugged them and they chatted like nothing had happened. And eventually the invitation, I th if I remember correctly, the invitation was extended for him to join the back, uh, join back, uh, the ba uh, join the back, uh, join the band back. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've been there too. You, so. <laughs> been, that's that's <laughs> tongue, t tongue twisters. Um, so I guess, yeah, he came back to the band. But yeah. I guess it just has some sort of agreement where he didn't want to sing or say certain things that do not align with his mm -hmm. with his beliefs now. But they're, pr I mean, if you see them live, they're, they're the same band. They still rock out. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Same yeah. with Skillet. Yeah. Skillet. Sk yeah. Skillet. It's, mm -hmm. You know, it's a very known Christian band. Yeah. I know people in the Christian world that say, oh, they left. They sold. They, they, they're sellouts. And then people, of course, in the secular world, they don't really... There's people that will like, I'll listen to your music. You're cool. Just, you know, I don't agree with you, but your music is cool. And there's some other people who totally trash them. But the rock community, the metal community is known for being very accepting. Um, it's probably harder for someone who has beliefs, religious beliefs to, you know, you probably have a harder time being accepted, but it happens. Striper back in the 80s, they used to, I think, hand out bibles and they used to have this song called to hell with the devil and they toured with maybe slayer i think so slayer striper christian hair metal band slayer the type of music they are <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's yeah. it's crazy yeah and um i i'm sure you have a million more stories um but we'll this be here till tomorrow morning yeah so i i enjoyed all of these <laughs> stories this conversation before we started recording, we were trying to figure out when was the last time we hung out. And it just dawned on me as we were recording. Um, it wasn't the corn. Uh, it wasn't that concert. It was actually uh, Blink-182. Oh, wait, yeah. wait. Oh, that's right. Yes. I was just, shooting that concert. You, you were we were talking and I was like, you know, it just, the light went up. And I was yeah. like, oh, I lied. No, <laughs> I saw you recently, actually, for Blink-182. That was a year ago. Mm -hmm. So... Wait, you actually came to visit me to meet my 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 daughter like two years, two and a half years yeah, ago. Yeah, see, we're remembering yeah. now. Yeah. Now we're, we're remembering, like, I know. <laughs> and and to all the listeners, I'm holding Mary accountable that I'm not going to let more so many months or years pass before we get together again. Of course, after COVID, right? But um, yeah, it was a Blink-182. Mm -hmm. uh, my bestie, uh, Miranda, shout out, Miranda Panda. Hey. Um, <laughs> she was uh, on tour with Blink and uh, Lil Wayne, mm -hmm. right? Actually, he canceled that night. 
Was oh that's right that's right yeah. that's right well you, you were at the Irvine show mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. yeah so the because I shot the forum and the forum is like for you guys that don't know the forum is like uh, where the Lakers used to play way back in the day so it's a big arena it's a big uh, venue and, and it's hold, uh, essentially like, across the street sim- well not uh, literally across yeah. the street from the new stadium yeah from the new stadium which is probably uh, here millions and millions yeah. of dollars so it's like twenty yeah. Oh, the yeah. new stadium? Mm-hmm. Five billion. Because I I'm a Rams fan. <laughs> I was off then. <laughs> I oh, was like which, millions and which millions. Which is another topic. Yeah. I mean, we have a shared love for... Well, we go into that for the Niners. Yeah. But yeah, the, the Blink-182 show. So I shot the... I shot the... Um, I shot the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Forum concert. Lil, I, I did see Lil Wayne. Um, Rayu. I was there with my friend Rayu and myself. Miranda, of course, got us some passes and... Um, it's always cool. I, I feel as a fan, it never goes away that you get to enter through the other gates, not the general admission. Mm-hmm. And it's, I mean, it, it's cool, but it's nothing that makes you any better or worse than any other fan that pays for a ticket. Mm-hmm. I buy my tickets too. Yeah. And I want to remind people, I, I buy tickets. If I get to shoot a show, that's the bonus. That's the extra. It's never for granted that you're going to get to shoot a show or you never drop the name, you know, drop um uh, like name dropping to try to get access. That's not going to work, people. I have so many people ask me, like, oh, uh, do you need an assistant? Can you take me? Like, no, it doesn't work like that. Mm-hmm. There's a name. There's a list. There's a limit. Like, n- before a photographer was needed, now they just borrow a picture from any cell phone, a great picture that someone posted on social media, and that's published, and that's it. We are a dying breed unless you maybe reinvent yourself. Mm-hmm. So I maybe that's why I went from just photographer to capturing video and uh, doing the interviews because that kind of keeps you relevant. Yeah. Which you got to stay relevant. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I give myself, what, 10 years before I maybe I'm too old to be cool. Um, but that's that's opened a lot of doors. Uh, if I'm not shooting the show, I'm doing an interview or doing some video, um, which I'm not a great I'm not a filmmaker. But I just happened to capture videos, and I, there's this photographer. I forgot his name right now. His bio said, "I'm talentless, but well connected." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, that gets that, everywhere. Yeah, yeah, that gets you. That helps. Yeah, that so. helps. And mm. you know, I like that you're very humble. Um, and, and really, very, very, very humble. <laughs> you have no idea. It's a sin to be this humble. No, <laughs> thank, <laughs> thank you. No, I mean, I'm a. I'm a I'm just a regular guy, of course, like I said earlier, from a small town in Mexico who had posters of all these rock stars on his wall. And, of course, there's people who I admire who have accomplished a lot, lot more. But to be honest, I had a lot of things against me. And I feel that I started late. Like, I've been shooting forever, but my rock and roll photography, I started, like, at 27. A lot of kids now, these or be way back in the day, like, when I started, people had 10 years ahead of me. Mm-hmm. But I don't see a lot of them. You're still here. I'm still here. There's a handful of people that I know and that I admire the, who are still in the game. One of them being Jack Lou from... Uh, uh, Jack Lou used to shoot Guns N' Roses way back in the day. And he's got pictures from... The, he shot Van Halen in, his early, in their early days. And Guns N' Roses. And he has like this recognition record. You know, his pictures are hanging at Sammy's camera. You know, backstage pictures, backstage pictures of Guns N' Roses, and I mean, there's a whole bunch of people. Neil Preston, the guy who shot Queen, and you, you guys know, like that picture where Freddie Mercury is bending backwards, mm-hmm. and there was like the the Wembley Stadium. Mm-hmm. You know that picture? Mm-hmm. I got to meet him, and I got to chat with him, and Iconic. I got to, <laughs> exactly. He's yeah. one of my rock and roll heroes, and um, I got to take a picture with him. I interviewed him a little bit, and then I got him to take a picture of. I got to take a picture with him standing next of my favorite image of his, which is that Freddie Mercury. Um, uh, you know, and on and on and on. And all these rock and roll photographers, um, I don't, I'm not going to be like them. But it's been really cool and humbling when I guess way back in the day, it was um, uh, I had a, c- a couple projects where pe- I was working with a couple bands and people came to me and they handed out a poster that of one of my pictures who that that was um uh a vip session ultra exclusive print poster 
only for the people that had purchased a VIP session for this one band, right, on tour. And I guess at the time, uh, people remembered my name or they saw my brand because it's Rockin' Picks and it's spelled differently, right? And that's that was one of the purposes I wanted to have Rockin' Picks, not like R O C K I N G, but more like R O Q N, Rockin' Picks, P I X, right? Um, but I, ha- I remember having people coming to me and like, dude, you're the. <laughs> this is embarrassing to it. Um, I used to be called the MySpace photographer on MySpace. Yeah. For all the for all the young kids, I'm sure you guys have heard of MySpace. It's embarrassing. I used to be I used to go by the MySpace photographer. So anyways, I had kids come to well, people come to me and ask me to autograph their their VIP session poster uh, or the sleeves of some cities that I um had pictures in of some you know, a couple of bands that I worked with and that was cool. Yeah. But still humbling, but it, it's 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 cool you know you just can never believe you're all that because i learned from from many great photographers that they behave like they're no one like they're nobodies Mm -hmm. they just keep it cool i'm i'm just here documenting carry on carry on now how can people find you if they want to follow you on social media uh you can find me when i step out of my house (laughs) now what's your address my address social media it's r-o-q-n P I X at R O Q N P I X at Rock and Picks. Um, the other my portraits that I do, which um, sometimes I just post most most of my other, the way you introduce me, the weddings and social events and such. But I sometimes have done work with musicians that are more like portrait, not music stylized. But um, that's fifty millimeter images. That's five zero mm images, and uh, on Instagram and Facebook. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. I have all those those two handles. That's what I go by. Uh, mostly Instagram and, and Twitter. And, of course, that's that's how we keep relevant. Yes. I'm trying to get in the TikTok game, but I got no time. Yeah. Are yeah. you on TikTok? I am, I am on TikTok. Um, oh, yes. We just connected on TikTok. So, but, so I'm one of those lurkers. So I, I am obsessed with TikTok. I, 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 w- I was one who didn't want to be on TikTok. Same. Until covid hit and then my friend would my friend my my cousin sabrina and my friend christina used to send me tiktok videos via text they would just be like (laughs) and i would be laughing so finally i was like yeah so i was like you know what i'm gonna get a tiktok and i logged on you know i don't i have not posted any videos but i log on and i in my timeline i am laughing so fucking hard what's your favorite type of video oh my god that's the thing so when are I, you, uh, when are I you, first started... Are you started, into the dancing videos? No, oh, I okay. hate that. So I have a friend. Chocolate. Yes, I have a friend. And I love you, Elaine. I really do. But she always wants to do those challenges, videos. I fucking detest them. <laughs> Same. But I'll do them for her. I've done like two with her. But oh, I hate I've that. Had to see. Send me those oh, links. I'll I, post them up, people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll. But w- when it comes to my personal one, I don't post anything. I just watch. And I... Lurker. I'm a lurker. I laugh really hard. So anything that's sweet or anything funny, any you know. Any of those videos have made you cry? Maybe one. Maybe and one. I can't think of it because I've liked like a million. You know videos. what I watch on TikTok? <laughs> Financial. Stuff. Yeah. I'm, I'm very drawn to making maybe um, my, my next move. Like I'm already thinking if we are having some sort of financial, no, uh, house housing crisis i don't want to say crisis but i've been telling the family let's pull out the equity and let's invest it in a new house because i used to be a landlord for 15 years which brings me to a cool point and i know we're supposed to wrap up but some of you know who dita von is you know who oh, dita von i love right? her so um, yeah. have you ever seen my my picture the picture of the see no evil hear no evil speak no evil mm-hmm with a Darth Vader mask girl. Okay. So that was one of my friends who was visiting. Uh, we shot this like at two in the morning before her flight at seven in the morning from LAX. Right. And then I went to one of my neighbors, which at the time I didn't, I, I did not know who she was. I just knew her by her real name. And then, but I knew she was a performer cause she had been a Cirque du Soleil dancer kind of uh, performer. Uh, so she was my one in, only attempt to uh, try to get some sort of performance lingerie kind of thing because we were shooting like a dark, sexy Darth Vader. Uh, 
And this lady, she was one of Dita Von Teese's, um dancers, like one of the acts in the Dita Von Teese show. I just knew she was one of those dancers. I didn't know her professional name until one of my friends realized who my tenant and slash friend was. And he said, that's Lara Nikolska. I'm like, no, that's XX, her name. Like, no, dude, that's Lara Nikolska. I'm like, no. And then he pulls out, like, Google, Google's her name. And I'm like, oh, shoot, that is? What? I didn't know she had a professional stage because I knew her as my friend and yeah. tenant. Yeah. And, and, you know, next thing you know, she hooks me up with a couple of tickets to go see her perform Dita Von Tees, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. That kind of thing. Um, Felipe Esparza, what's up, fool? You know who Felipe Esparza is? Oh, M- Mary's nodding, yes. Uh, shout out to my boy Felipe. Felipe, um, last comic standing winner. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, yes, he yes, has, yes. You know, <laughs> he looks like this. Or he talks like this, fool. So I didn't know who he was. He was, you know, Lisa and him, you know, the tenants of my, my old building. And I om- he almost got in trouble because he was not a registered, te- registered tenant. Mm. And next thing you know, he moves out. And two weeks after, I see him on TV. I'm like, wait, isn't that my ten? Years after, we're like in the same video with Metalachi for Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, all these things. I guess somehow I, all these people are either I'm gra- I gravitate towards them or they gravitate yeah, towards me. It's destiny, dude. It's destiny. Like, destiny, dude. Like, How do you know all these people? Like Francis. I, there's this guy, one of my friends, well, my tenants. Who I see like his commercials on TV of Corona and all these commercials is on tv and he was one of my tenants too mm. hey shout out to francis gonzalez uh yeah i mean all these people that just got to me when yeah. i was a landlord yeah or the shows anyway. destiny life has life puts the people that need to be in your life like you yeah if and you wouldn't like have you. if you wouldn't have failed that spanish class spanish class i failed spanish yo puedo hablar español a ver marie puedo hablar español pero no lo puedo escribir muy bien por qué Porque, bueno, mi mamá me enseñó con un silibario. Um, que, sí, I'm getting, so, yeah. so get this, guys. So I speak fluent Spanish, but my... But you sp- get nervous? I, I get, n- no, no, no. So I was born in the U.S., so I think in English. Yep. Um, I know friends who think in Spanish. And speak English. And speak English fluently that you wouldn't know. So for me, I speak fluent Spanish. It's a very monotone spanish yeah. um with words from different cultures but my brain i get stuck because i think in english exactly um so that's the that's why i failed spanish i used to be, <laughs> I used to be against i mean I, I used to think that it was so stupid how this was me way back then okay and then again remind let me remind you guys i came to the u.s when i was like eight years old mm-hmm. no word of english of course i i picked it up in about six months and i was up and running but um I guess my in my experience, I, I guess it's different because I get what you're saying because I hear people say that. Mm-hmm. Like if my mom speaks English or her limited English, sure as hell she's thinking in Spanish, trying to, tr- trying to translate into English. Mm-hmm. For me, it's like there's, I'm like in between. Mm-hmm. Again, I, I grew up speaking Spanish. English is my second language. I do a, a little bit of Deutsch and Italiano. Um, but... I don't I for me it's like I'm neutral. Yeah. I, I understand what you're saying because I yeah. hear it often. I don't I guess I'm just like I don't have to of course I don't have to think how I sp- speak even though I just get stuck. I have so many ideas mm-hmm. and I'm trying to funnel them. Mm-hmm. I have a hard time with that. Yeah. All these ideas. Yeah. And then they're just trying to make it to this very narrow That's a creative mind for you. Is it, right? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. It just starts going to many different yeah. directions. And and so that's my problem. So, you know, I we're gonna practice more yeah <laughs> we're gonna get Dave Lombardo and Tomas Araya <laughs> from Slayer and all these you know all these rock stars that are I connect with a lot of them they're Mexican mm-hmm. I mean um, everyone asks maybe the same question I try to do different things with people who are raza like I mentioned Jose Mangan you know who's a metal ambassador Sincarin from Ministry who's Mexicano we speak Spanish here and there um uh, Ra Diaz from Suicidal Tendencies. You know, he's Chileno. He, he lived in Mexico. Um, yeah. Ashes from Devil Driver. He's, he's like full-on 
I didn't know he was Mexican, but then he's freaking tall Mexican. And then, <laughs> ¿Qué onda, carnal? You know, like, whoa, dude. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. I, I connect with all these guys. Yeah. So, well, this has been a lot of fun. I'm sure we can probably do more episodes because you have so many stories. Um, but we only touched, I think, the tip. <laughs> That's what it. she said. Yeah. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, I got you. <laughs> so. Is this supposed to be PG-13? No, rated R, like, not uncensored. So, it's, that's what Good. I think makes it fun. That's what makes it fun. Um, But I'm going to cut it here. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm going to cut it here <laughs> because I want to make sure I don't run out of battery here. But thank you so much for thank being you. on this. Mary. 20 years of knowing you. I'm so proud of you doing this. Oh, and thank you. I want to have you as a friend, a dear friend for life. Yes. And shout out to our, my employees who are in the background. <laughs> yes, <laughs> make, yes. Making noise. All right. Well, thank you for listening, everyone. See you next time. Bye. Thank you. That was episode 36 of Purposely Curious Podcast. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and on most podcast platforms. And follow us on social media at Purposely Curious on Instagram and at Purposely C Pod on Twitter. That's Purposely, the letter C, pod. Until next time, rock on, baby.